Warm greetings from Cluj, the unofficial capital of Transylvania, Romania. My name is Gabriela Mocan and I'm an academic, translator and cultural enthusiast who has directed and produced various cultural projects globally. This autumn we are celebrating the Romanian Rivata magazine, a wonderful project on which I am extremely happy and honoured to have worked with the European Literature Network UK. As guest editor for the rest of Romania section of the magazine, since its main focus was the city of Timisoara and its authors, I have narrowed down my list of writers to present some of the biggest names in Romanian letters today, whose books are to appear in English translation in the coming months. Needless to say, there are so many more valuable writings out there for you to discover and I very much hope that through our joint efforts, British publishers will become more interested in what Romania has to offer. I take this opportunity to personally thank all contributing authors and translators for their great enthusiasm and to encourage readers worldwide to get their own magazine copy and join our riveting Romaniac Club. Hello everyone, it's me again and I'm in Wiltshire, at home in Wiltshire, and I'm going to introduce you to one of my favourite poets who's at home in Herefordshire, uh, Fiona Sampson, and uh, greetings to you. And to you, Rosie. Fiona is a poet, a writer, a teacher, professor of poetry, founder of festivals, an editor, an indefatigable supporter of poets and poets and poetry around the world, including Romania. Now, I don't know how many books exactly, but I got to about number 28. Fiona's published about 28 books and then I gave up. Um, so she is very widely published and very widely translated as well. And she's uh, written most recently um, one, one book I absolutely adore. It's the brilliant biography um, In Search of Mary Shelley. So it's a double, treble, quadruple joy to have Fiona Sampson with me today. And Fiona's also contributed to uh, the Romanian Riveter. So, and you in the Romanian River of Fiona, we're talking about um, Anna Blandiana. Now, tell me about your, your interest in your love of Romanian literature, your love of Romania, and then introduce us to Anna Blandiana's poetry. Well, it's such an enormous thing to talk about. And thank you for this, Rosie. Um, I've always loved writing from around the world and writing that's been translated from different languages. I think there's a certain sort of, I don't know, a fifth or sixth dimension that translation adds. There's an extra mystery to translated poetry. I mean, it's through a glass darkly. There are lots of discussions about how you can't translate poetry and it's what's lost in translation. But I think that the very best work, like the Riveter, can, add a dimension rather than lose it. And when around the end of the last century, terrible thing to say, um, I started work as a director of the Stephen Spender Memorial Trust. I was the first person in that post, wonderful job, fascinating. So uh, the program that I was asked to set up was scouting for writers to support into publication in this country from post-communist Europe. These were the countries which we then called the EU accession countries. They weren't yet even part of the EU. And uh, it was prose and poetry, it was wonderful. And one of the first things that I did was to um, go to a British Council conference on the Black Sea at Ovidius, um, where I met lots of Romanian writers, including the also indefatigable Denise Comenescu, a great editor and poet, uh, not necessarily in that order, who, with whom, um, I plotted to set up Orient Express, which was contemporary writing from the, as we called them then, EU enlargement countries. That was another of our names. Um, so, and that was just wonderful because I started scouting for writers for the magazine. I was scouting for writers for the Stephen Spender Trust program. Um, I met so many amazing people and I was absolutely bowled over by the literatures I met, encountered. Their range, their ambition, particularly in the poetry. It was a time in Britain of British kind of cool Britannia poetry, not very risk-taking, not always so high stakes. And then there was this kind of blast of passion and color and importance and engagement 
from the countries that, that I was exploring, particularly Romania, where I was particularly excited by the fact that most of the leading poets at that moment were women. They had been allowed to be, and they had allow, been allowed to be poets who, as it were, spoke aloud, spoke about politics, spoke about metaphysics, spoke about life and death. So not only about the linen cabinet and, cabinet, cabinet and falling in love, you know, they, they spoke about stuff that really mattered and they weren't demure and they were risk-taking and they ranged from the sort of postmodern, someone like Magda Kurnetsch to, um, to Anna Blandiana or Mariana Marin who had real, really strong, I mean, humbling backgrounds in political direct activism. And it was also in their work to someone like Liliana also, who is so beautiful and um, spiritual. I mean, a deeply religious writer. So I just felt as though the scales had fallen from my eyes and there was so much to see and learn. Well, I mean, that makes me feel very excited as well, too, because, I mean, what you've done is not just champion them, but you've also enjoyed reading them, I know, as well. And um, one of the reasons we asked you to um, to look at the poems of Anna Blandiana is because I know you, you love her very much indeed. And um, you. You, you've said that you will read a couple for us for our, our launch. So fire away. And if you could just introduce the poems as well, um, that would be yes. great. I'd love to. Um, obviously, I'm going to read from the Riveter. Um, and so these are translated by Viorica Patea, who came to Ledbury with Anna Blandiana when I curated the Romanian Women Poets um, sessions there. And they came and had a wonderful Sunday lunch in the Herefordshire countryside. And we wandered up and looked at our sheep and ate, picked cherries and ate them together uh, with Paul Scott Derrick. Um, and I thought that I'd read one early poem and one middle period poem from Anna's work. The first time I ever heard Anna read was in uh, Ljubljana Castle at the Villanitsa, the big poetry festival there. And she was, I think, the laureate that year. And um, she had this extraordinary presence with this very quiet, feminine, still voice, but she was reading these high stakes poems. And she was saying, in a sense, with her voice, the personal is political and the political is personal. I am a person, never mind, well, never mind, including what in what I write. So I'd like to begin with this early poem, Oh Your Body, which is published in 1972, which is indeed about the very personal. Oh Your Body. Oh, I still see your body through the ink, ink that stains us even in our dreams like bitter animal sweat. I want to reach you and my fingers slide. I can hardly see you. I can hardly hear you. Tell me, tell me once more that the whirlpool I plunge into darkens us both the same. I call to you, but the ink runs violently out between us as though from a wound. Do you still know me? Still wait for me? Will you still let me go back? Will you still receive me from the purple mud? Will you still come back to these blue fields, the desert seas, speechless and in tears, so I can offer my trembling mouth and lips, bruised with words, to your kiss? It's amazing, the colorist work in that poem as well. And this is a... It's still quite an early poem, 1990, so published just after uh, Ceausescu was deposed, but obviously written before he was. Um, this is Omphalos. A stone is a god that moves so slowly, my swiftly dying eye cannot perceive the motion. As we cannot ask a wave, a cloud, to understand the ocean. When everything collapses and afterwards dissolves into a poisonous mixture of yesterday and tomorrow, a stone is a seed of the world still alive, the shriveled sense that remains, omphalos and bud, from which the whole murdered universe will grow again. When the god that was shattered into equal stones will rise up, as a barricade. 
And I think, Rosie, we were talking earlier, weren't we, about how strongly um, Anna's work speaks to us, you know, in terrible times. I mean, it's beautiful work, but it speaks to us, for example, now during the pandemic, even though clearly this is a poem about a world that's ending under the absolute cruelty of that dictatorship. For all of us, the dictatorship is still there. The trauma of that time is definitely there. But I must say, reading these poems again today, I feel quite a chill. I mean, the murdered universe. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, you know, things are happening which we have no control over. And it's it's chilling. It's chilling. Yeah. And I, I think that thing, amazing thing she does, where she does this kind of thought experiment so that... Um, the stone is actually a living god it's the it's it's living it's just that it moves a bit too slowly for us to be able to see it we are too swift we are too fleeting that slowing down of our mental picture of time is extraordinary um have you heard about the living stones by the way of romania because um it's it's fascinating that this particular poem because the the festival's name for the whole festival, it's called Romania Rocks. And yes. not just about the dreadful alliteration for which I apologize, and for the fact that Romania does rock, as you and I know, it's about these stones that um, exist in Romania, really special part of Romania. They are actually living, moving, growing stones. And I do wonder sometimes when I hear that poem, whether actually mm -hmm. Anna Blandiana was thinking of those. You should have a look, have a look online. Yeah. Our logo actually reflects the, the rock. That's interesting. Of course, rock is growing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you know, sedimentary rock is still being laid down. And remember, that actually, someone, actually, a Japanese poet, saying to me once at a, at a festival, "Oh, you know, when are rocks still being made? Are rocks still growing?" And of course, your first answer is no, of course not. They're not. But the second answer is, well, yes, they are, aren't they? Every time there's a volcanic eruption, there's more yeah. lava, yeah. which does basalt. Yes, and it's, yeah. We're it's fascinating. Yes, we're on a mut more mutable planet than we would perhaps like, aren't we? Yeah, we are, yes, um, indeed. Now, Fiona, as a, a final treat, I know you also have one of your poems, um, which did you write this, which is connected with Romania? Did you write it in Romania, about Romania, um, looking back on Romania? Tell us, tell us the background to this poem of yours. Romania um, has really influenced my poetry. I mean, I've, I've published Romanian charms in some of my collections. I've, you know, worked close. I've written four Romanian poems, ep epistolary, you could say, poems for Romanian poets, like for Yana Yerenim, when we've made radio programs together. Um, and I, I think that what I was saying about the high stakes, I think that that runs through all my work. That's the lesson I learned. So this is a poem from The Catch and it's called Bear Dancing and it's for Ioanna Yeronim. What is bear and what is the dancing man inside the bear skin? What sweat and what stink of tallow hang between the man and the old skin he wears, inside which the man dies as bear is reborn? Why does man put on bear? In from darkness, raise doubt out of the dark. And who dances whom when, like a hand dipped in a wound, the fear is danced over and over? I think one of the things that visiting Romania has done is allowed me the resource of myth, and also interested in myth in this country. I'm going to show you this bowl, which. Um, it's obviously not old, but I bought it in the Ethnographic Museum in Bucharest. And I thought of this poem because I was just recently talking to my um, translator into Albanian and who was saying, was struggling with what this poem was about and said, is there really a cup? Is there really a bowl? Is there really a grail? And I said, there's not a grail, but there is a bowl. This is called Parsifal. The stag painted on the bowl has leafy branching antlers. The huntsman could hide in them, et in Arcadia ego. But this stag knows he carries death in his green antlers. 
He raises the tree of life, raises the cup of death between the trees in midwinter as arrows stream like rays among the dead trees from the cupped and risen sun. My spoon chimes on the stag's chest, on the golden heart he carries between lines of black glaze. He's upraised, golden heart.